what was your impression of three main characters, leaders in the area? Martin McGinnis, Jerry Adams, and Tony Blair, who were courageous and still remain courageous to the present day. All were. But you should include in that list David Trimble, mm -hmm. who was the leader of the also Unionist Party, the largest Unionist Party. John Hume, who was on the nationalist side, the architect, the visionary, the man who conceived not just the process, but the mechanisms by which the negotiations would occur. And, and that was a critical factor. What happens in all of these conflict situations <clears throat> is you have overlapping, intersecting, sometimes even contradictory conflicts. You, you look now in the Middle East. We, we are allies of Turkey. There, we're helping the Kurds fight against ISIS, but Turkey is fighting against the Kurds. We are opposed to the Assad regime in Syria. We are opposed to ISIS, but ISIS is fighting the Assad regime. Over and over again, you find historically these conflicts are very tangled. They're, they're not given to simplicities. They require a deep and profound understanding of the history and motivating <coughs> factors. And sorting them out is not an easy thing to do. And John Hume established the framework by which we sorted the issues out. So we didn't end up with just one negotiation. We actually had three. But, but John couldn't have done it with, without, without you. In 1996, you put together the Mitchell Principles, and in 1998, you basically surprised the world with the Good Friday Agreement with the parties. What did you specifically do that nobody else was able to do? And there were countless people that have tried for ages, decades to do this, and even centuries to do this. What did, what would you attribute to what you were able to do at that time? Because it was incredible. It's not what I was able to do. It's what the political leaders of Northern Ireland were able to do. On the very first day, I said several things to them. I said, I don't come here with an American peace plan. There is no Mitchell plan. There is no Clinton plan. When an agreement is reached, if we can reach an agreement, it will be your agreement. Because the one thing I know, I said to them, when it's over, I'm going back home, and you will have to live with the consequences. So it is not for me to impose upon you how you live. It is for you to agree upon how you will live, and I will testify in favor of it. Now, when we got to the end of the process, years later, and I presented to them the draft peace agreement. I said to them orally, and I put in writing in a memorandum, every word of this agreement has been spoken or written by a person from Northern Ireland. There is not a word in this document that is not yours. Now, I confess to you, and I've said publicly, that I and my colleagues, I had two great colleagues, the former Prime Minister of Finland and the former Canadian Chief of the General Military Staff. We drafted the agreement. So, of the millions of words that were written and spoken, we decided the relative handful that would go into the agreement. And those were value judgments. So, we did play a role. But in the end, it was their agreement. It's their country, it's their life. And they <coughs> have to own the process. It can't be imposed externally. It has to come from within, creating the circumstances in which they could meet, talk, debate, argue, ultimately helping them to agree is a contribution to the process, but the real heroes are the people and the political leaders of Northern Ireland.